My name is Tanzina Vega. I'm a digital correspondent for CNN. I've written about everything from technology to media to race in America for the New York Times and for CNN most recently. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. To my right, we've got Kay Madadi, who's an executive vice president and chief digital officer of BET. Next to Kay, we've got Alex Sepiel, who's the senior vice president of original scripted programming at USA Network. Next up, we have William Caballero, who's a filmmaker most recently known for, and we'll probably see a clip of this, Grandpa Knows Best. <laughs> and Natoki Ford, who is a senior policy advisor for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Thank you all for being here today. So when we first got here, we saw this, what they call a sizzle reel, I'm sure you all know that, in the business. And it showed us some clips from the Paley archive, looking at different representations of some characters that you might have seen or known before. We saw a little bit of BET's The Startup, we saw USA Mr. Robot, um, and my personal favorite, Steve Urkel from Family <laughs> Matters. Um, you know, are we getting any better at I guess, portrayals of geeks of color, which is something, which is a new thing apparently now, we're hearing a lot of that online. What was something that resonated with you all from that sizzle reel? Were there anything, were any moments that stood out? Well, I think one thing is actually, it's interesting that I think in general, Hollywood hasn't done a great job of uh, not stigmatizing people of technology in general. I think no matter what, there's always sort of this arm's length attitude towards when some character starts speaking in what they call tech speak, you know, in that clip reel, you know, all of a sudden they're stigmatized as a nerd in general. And I think for, you know, for STEM and for everything else, I think it's, you know, I think one thing that Hollywood should be doing better is destigmatizing just people who work in technology or have an interest in science and technology and all of those things. Yeah, I think this stuff is getting sexy now. Um, <laughs> And uh, I don't know whether movies like The Social Network um, or, or stories of these you know, kids who drop out of college who then become millionaires or billionaires are part of that. Um, so I think you're beginning to see more of it um, on television, in film. Um, I know that we, we tackled it with the startup, which uh, we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it, it's now it, geek is sexy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine once uh, um, who was not in the media business and uh, called me the Puerto Rican Lois Lane because I'm a reporter. <laughs> and while Superman, the original Superman, was one of my favorite movies, I'm not sure how much of a connection there was in influencing my ultimate career choice. But I guess the question here is we are starting to see more portrayals of people of color who are doing, um, who are involved in tech, who are getting into this industry. How much of a connection is there between the media representation of people of color and tech and STEM on television, in film, to ultimately getting people excited about these careers? I mean, do any of you have any influences in media that might have influenced what you're doing today? Or do you think that these, these images are actually helping to drive some of that? Well, well, one thing, oh, am I on? Mic check? You're on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, one thing I can say that's happened but that's been tremendously powerful is some of you all may have heard of the CSI effect where there were uh, these series of TV shows that focused on forensic science and sort of unintentionally they had this really great impact on getting students interested in pursuing uh, careers in forensic science. There was an actual spike in the number of students that enrolled in programs and colleges. The public in general became fascinated with the art of uh, and the quality of data and evidence that was presented. So I think when we see that there's literally when we have these great shows and we have these um, characters in these TV lines or these uh, plot lines that are really exciting. And I think it's a really great way of showing that there is a connection between how people see things and connect with it in fiction, but in real life it can have an impact on them and their perceptions about these fields in everyday life. Yeah, there was a young woman at, actually at the Paley Center event for Mr. Robot uh, last week that um, stood up and said that the show had inspired her to become a major in computer science, which is like, so that, I think that's that very, you know, I'm sure after Raiders of the Lost Ark, there were a lot of people that went to archaeology because they thought that was fun. So like, I think anytime you can make heroes Not as it, high paying, though. No, probably not. Maybe. <laughs> um, so, Natoki, you were 
um, talking a little bit about the CSI effect. I'm curious if you could tell the audience a little bit about what the White House is doing specifically to sort of help connect the dots here between media representation and um, technology fields. Sure, so I am leading a really awesome and exciting project called The Image of STEM. And the goal of this work is to essentially infuse mainstream entertainment media with positive and compelling stories, stories and images. And this is a part of our larger work to promote diversity in STEM because we recognize the tremendous power of storytelling to have an impact on the public's knowledge, attitude, and behaviors about STEM subjects and also careers. And so the project essentially has three aims. One is to focus on awareness raising within the industry. So uh, there was a comment earlier in the first panel about talking to the people who aren't already aware of this issue of the workforce challenges with STEM. And so thinking about the entertainment community, showing that diversity is, gonna not, is not going to necessarily compromise the bottom line of Hollywood, um, and that STEM is also very important. And so awareness raising about STEM, about unconscious bias, how this affects writers, how this affects us all in our everyday lives, and we're not aware of it because it is unconscious. Um, and so yeah, the project is focused on awareness raising within the, in within the industry, um, tools development, looking at the space of the people who are doing research in this area, both counting diversity in images, but also looking at impacts of media. Uh, there's also a really interesting question about big data in the entertainment sector and how with all these different platforms like Netflix, Hulu, et cetera, how do we learn more about people and their, um, based on their consumer habits, what their interest levels are and how it translates and can help inform the development of new uh, projects. And then lastly is, again, figuring out what is gonna motivate the industry to actually respond and act. So what sort of carrots do we need to dangle? What sorts of things need to happen that will really get us to see what we want to see in film and, and TV? And so it's, it's about making sure that the industry is aware of that we should not, we shouldn't normalize inequality in the stories we tell. We should, we should create more aspirational visions for, for what we would like to see. And so that's essentially what the work that I'm leading and it's uh, effectively about looking at what's already happening and thinking about what we can lend to the movement as the White House with our ability to celebrate, to convene, and to impact policy. So we have a, a little bit of time left in the Obama administration, <laughs> but I'm optimistic that we can get some great things done. Awesome, thank you. Um, Alex, I want to turn to you for a second. Mr. Robot, and for those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, it's a really great show, really recommend it to you. Um, there are a lot of diverse characters on the show, and I know the show is influenced in part by the Arab Spring and the technology that protesters were using there. We're also seeing a lot of that. Uh, more people of color are using technology and with Black Lives Matter, for example. Technology has become a critical organizing tool, particularly for people of color. Um, I'm curious about whether the casting and the, the influence for this show was intentional. Did people really set out to cast? And we're gonna talk unpack casting a, a little bit down the road too. But for this show in particular, talk, talk to us about that. Sure, I mean, I, th I think it's you know, built into the show's DNA. Um, as you mentioned, you know, the show's creator, Sam Esmail, is an Egyptian American. His cousins in Egypt, you know, were were part of the Arab Spring. They used social media platforms like Twitter, and he, I think, derived a lot of inspiration for that when he was coming up with the show. Um, and so I think it's just in general, he thinks very carefully about the uses of technology and how that impacts um, society and a, and a whole range of issues. Um, and I think for him, he, you know, and it, a lot like the discussion before, a lot of this stuff is top down. Um, and so when you have a, a, a non-white creator, I think it does influence in terms of how you know, he, he in, in thinks about the casting and thinks about the inclusion of, of all of the characters in the world. Um, and uh, you know, some of it's scripted explicitly to be you know, characters that are diverse or have a certain background. And sometimes it was, they were just written and then in the casting process, someone would emerge. Um, and I think the thing is, I think it's, it's a mix of, I think, both naturalism and at the aspirational qualities um, that, that you were referring to. Um, I, I think it is meant to sort of authentically reflect the world that we live in um, in 2015, but I think it also is hopefully going to show you know, audiences that there, there are a range of people that work in, in the tech fields and that, that people of different backgrounds, you know, Brian Stokes Mitchell, an African-American actor, portrays the CTO of this major company. Um, you know, the, the character of White Rose, the, the inc you know, in incredibly shadowy, uh, interesting, you know, dark army, um, is, uh, B.D. Wong played a transgender woman. Um, and th those things, you know, aren't stigmatized on the show. It's sort of dealt with in a matter-of-fact fashion that I think is hopefully, you know, accurate, ref refreshing, and aspirational. And 
Kay, you wanted to weigh in on that? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's weigh in on great, something great else. Um, <laughs> because we're talking about diversity, and, and in, the, in the prior conversation, uh, the prior panel, we talked a little bit about the media, the business angle to this. And I think mm -hmm. there's a business imperative in media to also diversify. Often when I, I moderate a lot of panels on diversity and we get asked this question a lot, is it just about checking the box and just sort of what, what they were talking about earlier about filling quotas? And I think there's, there's absolutely a business imperative to do this and I'd like to hear from Kay maybe and Alex on that because you guys are really at the forefront of, of making some of those decisions so yeah um, uh, at BET we joke uh, uh, it was easier to uh, make programming when nobody else cared about black people watching television <laughs> um, everybody seems to care about black people watching television right? uh, and minorities in general um, and that's because they got the eyeballs, I well, mean. Uh, so what was interesting, and I don't know whether the statistic is 100% accurate, but I think something like 550 pilots were made for fall TV this, this, this year, and something like 55% uh, of them either involved diversity in some iteration, casting, directors, produ production companies, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the blackest upfronts ever um, happened uh, last uh, <laughs> Last day. <laughs> Y'all know what the upfronts are. Uh, Imagining us. Um, so, I mean, for a network like BET uh, and me, I, I oversee the digital operations at BET, where we're kind of focused on trying to be the black voice for the urban culture, urban which is now not necessarily driven by um, ethnicity anymore. Um, I believe that that lens um, begins to matter more, like um, how. CNN tells a story on, or doesn't tell the stories it may be, as we discussed, uh, this is no criticism on my colleague here, um, but uh, the Million Man March 20th anniversary wasn't really covered by mainstream media, but um, uh, companies like us and TV One and Revolt uh, Media were, were down there and telling the story from that kind of perspective. Uh, and I think that that begins to be even more critical. Now you, you take that to the topic that we're discussing now, does it encourage more people to consider these kinds of careers. Absolutely, media, media is an influence. I don't think it's the only thing. Um, I, the last panel talked about uh, who's the kingmaker. I think seeing visible examples, I'd love to see who the next uh, minority Mark Zuckerberg is, or um, I'd love to see, I mean, Tristan Walker is probably one of the most visible black people in tech uh, right now. Um, but you dig under the surface, there, there are a lot of people at some of these companies of, of influence who are actually running big businesses. At my former company, Facebook, there's a guy named uh, Aime uh, who could be one of the most senior engineers on Facebook's most um, important products. Uh, it's not known, but if you dig underneath the surface, I think those people also influence people getting into these kinds of careers and opportunities. And then the question is, will we end up seeing a, a movie about IMA or or so these folks sort of at the, at the center of it. And I know BET had um, a film called The Startup, uh, which looked at young black and brown digital entrepreneurs who were trying to get into a, a startup business. Um, you know, Silicon Valley, as was very well discussed in the previous panel, has been notoriously undiverse, particularly when it comes to black and Latino workers. Uh, Facebook just announced this new website to encourage participation among young black and brown uh, parents of color. Twitter has made very public diversity goals going forward. You know, with movies like The Startup, um, why, you know, do you think this is the, these films are, would actually help change some of these biases against STEM careers that, that might be coming from um, the minority community, black and brown community, that might feel like they can't access? Yeah, um, well, let's start with the selfish uh, motivations. Right? Good content is good content, right? Um, and stories about um, young entrepreneurs who, who make it big, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. Like, <laughs> like, um, it did very well for us. We're discussing whether or not it should become a TV series, and I think young people um, are much more attuned to the idea that you can come up with an idea and take that from nothing to something um, and, and, and get excited around thinking, uh, thinking like that, which was effectively what the movie was about, like a, a group of kids who came up with an idea and took it from social media to being a business and, and, and growing, growing it in that way. So um, I, I think uh, um, that that is ripe content. It's, it's, it's certainly germane in today's day and age about um, when you're creating millionaires with wealth, uh, not just rich, but wealth in, in Silicon Valley. 
Um, and I think it continues to put pressure on, on those big companies and those venture capital firms and accelerators and incubators to, um, to look wider than they have done in the past. Let's talk a little bit Actually, about, I'm sorry. I, add. I think what's also important to say is that the power of the stories, even fictional, is that they can present role models to kids. I think this was mentioned in the first panel as well, that they might not have access to otherwise in real life. And so I think the media alone won't do it, of course, but I think it can certainly help by helping these kids see themselves in people that look like them, that they can identify with. But also, stereotype threat is real. It can literally impact a young person's uh, interest in participating in STEM and also their ability to achieve can you because what that is, stereotype? yeah so stereotype threat is essentially when you feel that there's a negative stereotype for your group so if I'm a woman or I'm a person of color and my the stereotype says that I'm not supposed to be or I'm not good at math I'm not good at science then I will internalize that and believe that it's true and I don't I don't try to work or I might not work hard or I'm, I might not push myself or I might give up because I just don't believe that it's possible for me because this is what the the blanket stereotype is about my group and it's it's a terrible terrible thing that happens to people at various stages in their careers as well and so so that's the power of of storytelling is to try to help overcome the, this negative thing that's in, that's literally removing the interest and killing the the opportunities for young pe people because they just can't overcome this idea that it's just not for them and unfortunately sometimes we even in our communities and there was a comment earlier about parents the role of parents and I have to say I do believe parents play a role in that and it's hard for parents who don't have a background to be able to encourage their kids because they maybe they, they themselves feel intimidated by STEM and they are ascribing to or, or that stereotype. But I do think that it's important for parents to try to encourage their kids to believe in themselves that they can do anything and to push them um, to believe that with hard work, nothing comes easy for anyone. No one's born good at being good at math or science. You just have to work hard at it. And so, um, so yeah, so with all that said, I think the stories are important to help kids see themselves in these roles that maybe aren't traditionally what they have, have been envisioned in, but um, the parents also play a role in trying to help reinforce the idea that yes, you can be good at math, yes, you can be a, a, pro, a coder or a programmer, et cetera. Yeah, I want to go, uh, go ahead. Okay. I've, I've done something. Well, well to, to piggyback on that, I also, you know, for me, somebody who was born in the projects of Coney Island, New York City, and yet was raised in a North Carolina in a trailer behind my grandparents, uh, in my grandparents' backyard, I was, as Kay mentioned, a geek, a, a sexy geek, though, I will say. <laughs> uh, and my, hashtag and, sexy geek. Hashtag, yes, yeah. <laughs> right now. Make it trend. <laughs> and I played violin through public school starting in, uh, in uh, 10 years old. And I never saw, even to today, I don't see that sort of representation on TV. Yet, however, Hollywood sees the numbers of Latinos that love movies like The Fast and the Furious, and they think, oh, all Latinos love, you know, big, nice, fancy cars and, <laughs> and sexy women and all these things, and so let's just market toward that, but they're missing an, a market of people who are the intellectual African Americans, Latinos, the geeky ones of us who, in a way, will be the, the, the catalyst for that next renaissance of content that lifts up our community more than anything. Yeah, and uh, what I was going to say is um, we also need to widen, we in this conversation here, need to widen our definition of what um, media is today. Like if you're a young person, a millennial young person, your phone is probably attached to your arm as an extension of who you are. Um, uh, you are consuming just as much uh, digital video content as you are actually linear television. Um, and you actually have a different perspective. Uh, I hate to say it, like um, Instagram is not just a visual medium for, m for millennials. This is a business. They are watching people. We put on a show around five, five sisters who uh, built their Instagram followings up to five million each or some ridiculous number, and it is a business for them. And I think <coughs> kids are much more savvy about that kind of perspective and, and leading them towards this kind of, uh, the Kardashians with their apps that are tracking to make $32 million by the end of the year. I mean, that people are, are looking at these kinds of opportunities and, um, and entrepreneurship in different ways. And part of what, um, I wrote this story when, when I was at the New York Times covering media, but part of what drove a lot of these shows like Scandal um, and How to Get Away with Murder to the levels of popularity were black Twitter users who were tweeting, live tweeting, this was before, and I remember looking at 
my Facebook and Twitter and saying, okay, there's some people I'm following that are talking about this and no one else. And there was sort of like this divide. Now everybody's talking about it, but it was driven mostly by, oh, speaking of media. <laughs> Millennial. It was driven mostly by this gentleman here in the crowd. <laughs> Uh, but it was driven mostly by viewers of color who were very, very engaged on social media with this, with this show. And when we started looking at the numbers with Nielsen, we said, my God, we, we definitely have a story here. So, so to your point, um, William, you, I want to talk a little bit about content creation and technology. You are using a lot of this technology to create the films that you're working on. The name is Grandpa Knows Best. Grandpa Knows Best. Yeah. And this reminded me of my abuelo, my abuelo's grandpa. Yeah. Um, I want to, can you tell us just a little bit about it and maybe we have time for just a quick clip? Sure, sure. So, so basically, as I told you before, my family relocated to North Carolina uh, even though I was born in, in New York City. However, I returned back to New York City after receiving the Gates Millennium Scholarship that paid for my college. I went to Pratt Institute and uh, later NYU. And when I came down here, even though my family had all moved down to North Carolina, I, my, my, my grandfather would, would call me and leave these absurdly long and quirky voicemail messages. <laughs> and my grandfather, right now, he's an 87-year-old man from born in Puerto Rico, and he would give me these, these long messages. I'd be like maybe two minutes long. Like, like, and he calls me Davey. My middle name is David. He calls me Davey, not William. So he's like, Davey, don't forget. <laughs> you need to eat the good food and do the right thing. Don't eat any junky food. Don't listen to the bad music. <laughs> and so I, I, had, I had saved these messages. And what I did is I was looking for the perfect medium to combine all this together. And I found it through 3D printing. And after a first short film called How You Doing, Boy, voice most from grandpa, because when my grandpa picks up the phone, he says, how you doing, boy? He doesn't say hello. That's what he says. And so after a successful uh, festival run, I developed it into a web series, and with the help of my, of my creative team, consisting of my wonderful wife, uh, Kate Kaisel Caballero, 3D modeler, Chang Kim, uh, 3D uh, print specialist, uh, Seth Burney, and executive, co-executive producer, Elaine Del Valle, I was able to put together a web series where basically users on social media, that means you and you and you, get to ask grandpa his questions. That's actually the Twitter handle, at ask underscore grandpa. No D in grandpa, G-R-A-N-P-A. -A. They get to ask grandpa questions. And if I like it, I actually call him up and I ask him the questions and I edit them into <laughs> two minute shorts. I, I want to say I brought a special guest, not just grandpa, I brought Superhero Grandpa, which is one of the 30, the 30 poses of Grandpa that I created for this web series where I just call him up and I let him say whatever the hell he wants on these subjects and I later edit it down. So what you're hearing is not scripted comedy, but I, I feel that it's a way for me to not only preserve my grandfather and preserve his memory of who he is, but also to, to acquire a project that to me signifies uh, symbolizes the universality of the grandfather archetype. Because what I find so rewarding is when African Americans, Asians, Jewish people, Arabs, they come up to me after seeing grandpa and they say, your grandpa is just like my grandpa. Oh my <laughs> God, my grandpa says the same thing to me. He does this, this, and this. And I feel like that's, th yeah, he, he knows. He, he's like, I don't think check. I'm big celebrity, <laughs> but uh, okay. You know, I, I don't have the big money, but maybe. So, <laughs> so, so again, it's, it's my role as a content creator to not just tell stories that feature Latinos, but tell stories that in a way will embrace our culture and enlighten, empower, and express the viewer who we are. So I like to tell big stories using small figures. Fabulous. <laughs> I, um... I want, we're running short on time, and I want to make sure we get in questions from the audience. So I want to ask this question before we close out. Um, this summer, I started a little bit of a media uh, firestorm, if you will, around something called media diversity. Um, I wrote an article about why newsrooms are so white. Um, the lack of diversity in news media has been persistent uh, for decades, and I wanted to unpack that. It became a 72-hour Twitter chat, which I was trying to manage while I was at work. Uh, was very, very challenging, but this really started a conversation that continues to this day online. So if anyone ever wants to follow it, just hashtag media diversity, and we're always posting jobs and um, comments around that. 
Um, but that really begs the question a lot of the, the time, I think, particularly when it comes to media, who's behind the scenes? Um, how do we diversify? There was a great article in Slate, I don't know if any of you saw it earlier this week, about diversifying the writer's rooms uh, for a lot of the content that we see, diversifying our newsrooms. Um, there was a conversation, some of you may have heard, between a, someone named Matt Damon and um, <laughs> Effie Brown, uh, and he said, and I quote, when we're talking about diversity, you do it in the casting of the film, not in the casting of the show. Again, a hashtag uh, around that conversation um, about Matt's, um, you know, trying to quote unquote Damon Splain um, diversity to an African American filmmaker and an accomplished filmmaker and producer. Um, so I want to just throw this out to the panel. How do we begin to diversify behind the scenes, the writers' rooms? How much effort is being put into doing that? Oh. <laughs> so with with Grandpa which was a web series that within two weeks, HBO was in uh, talks to acquire and license the project. And Grandpa actually made history as being the first ever time HBO uh, Latino and HBO as an entity had ever picked up an interstitial series. So all these episodes are on HBO Go. You just have to click on uh, Latino series and search for Grandpa Knows Best. But I think what's important is not necessarily having, it, what, what's important, having people of color work as writers if they're working for writers on shows where all the characters are white <laughs> or having us come in as content creators and not just working behind the scenes but as creators of shows and and writers of the shows that we create as well because I think that if you have a producer who says we have in mind we're gonna do this comedy about X Y and Z then you're catering to what they think your demographic is going to like you know, and like I said with Fast and the, the, the Furious, you know, I, I don't really like driving fast cars. I mean, if, if I had one out, that would be great, but, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nerd and I like, you know, I paint my grandpas and, and that doesn't sound sexy, but when you see it, people get it. And I think that by giving us more of a chance and stepping outside of our, our boundaries, I think that, that taking those risks on creatives who want to do things differently to bring up their, our, um, N not just our race, but all minorities. I think that's what's important is for companies to believe in really creative and diverse visions. Mm -hmm. That was fa fabulous. We have some time for questions from the audience. I see one right there, gentleman in the back. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, directed towards Kay, uh, you have such an interesting background coming from Facebook to BET. Um, it's no doubt that media is such a, it's such a powerful medium. Uh, I formerly worked at CAA. Um, it's interesting to see people try to push to get like the diversity focus, leveraging between the bridge between media and entertainment, uh, media and technology, but it keeps falling flat. Like what you're doing, you have such a unique background. How do we get more Ks involved on the, like the entertainment side, leveraging um, their technology experience, especially when entertainment's such an archaic, like kind of broken model. Yeah. Um I, I always felt like a, a, a little bit of a fish out of water at, at, um, at, at Facebook in that um, most of the people there are engineers. Like, I, I wouldn't know how to code to save my life. Um, and the team that I ran was uh, partnership oriented with the media industry. And so I got good visibility into how this business is, is changing and working at the most senior levels across major media companies. So, the opportunity to actually, this is what I believe, and, and this is what I told everyone about the switch, because I think it surprised a few people. Um, I don't think television <laughs> companies are going away. I don't think media companies are, are going away. I do think that they will change. Um, if you paid attention to YouTube's announcement yesterday about um, YouTube Red, mm -hmm. um, it's gonna significantly change your consumption habits on YouTube starting October 28th, when all of the good stuff gets put behind a subscription wall and you need to make up your mind whether or not you want to pay $10 a month to, to see it. Um, and so that, that has downward pressure on people like me and USA and, and other television networks. So this is, this is changing. Um, uh, and I think the business is going to be differently. But the idea that great content is still going to be sought out uh, and, can, and we should be telling different kinds of stories uh, listen, I'm, I'm really heartened. Um, I don't know whether it's a passing fad. If we, if we have another black, black up front next April, I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin to believe in earnest 
that um, the executives at some of these companies are beginning to realize that um, these stories are resonating with audiences that they've ignored. Um, and, and listen, people follow the money. Empire is not a joke, right? <laughs> um, and that's not the only example. And, and the, the, only, the only thing is, is that Netflix is chasing it, Hulu's chasing it, YouTube will be chasing it. Um, Bob Johnson, who started BET, set up the Urban Movie Channel, which is a direct-to-consumer app, uh, $4.99 a month for black-themed mm -hmm. movies. Um, there are huge plays in this area, and it's just going to change the landscape. We have time for one more question, all the way in the back. Um, hi, I'm Dee Dee Brown, and I used to work in um, media as well, and I was one of the only African Americans who worked there on the business side, to say nothing of the newsroom. Um, so I empathize with you. So my question is, what do we as consumers need to do to communicate it's, William, sort of what you were saying. I love Fast and Furious movies, by the way, but I also am really enamored by Grandpa. Like, I want to <laughs> see more of that, too. Yeah. So what do we, as the consumers, need to do to convey that? Not just social media, but how do we get across to the studios? Um, I'm also a big fan of Suits, by the way. Um, how do we get across to the um, media outlets, entertainment outlets, that we want to see, we need to see this diversity? And it's not just social media. I'm sorry, even in the upfronts, you have all these black shows, but look at what happened to Craig Robinson. It went away very quickly. So they, they, they follow the trend, and then it sort of, sort of falls away. So what can we be doing? Thank you. Well, you said, I mean, not just social media, but I, I just as a person who works in a media company, we pay a lot of attention to social media. So I, I, I do think, actually, it's a profound platform for you know actually getting for democratizing access to you know media companies because we you know we read everything <laughs> or we try to um, and I think of you know when things trend when things become you know a, a bigger movement that that gets noticed so I think as a consumer I think that actually is a really you know positive step that one can take if you want to see things to change consumers are already voting um, uh, your eyeballs are moving from from linear to digital, um, you're seeking out on-demand um, content more and more. Uh, so um, your thumbs or your your fingertips as they type on keyboards or on mobile uh, are actually showing all of us that we have to work harder at actually telling you the kinds of stories that you want um, and delivering those to you on the platforms that you want whenever you want. Um, which is this is a big change. Like, uh, CBS has been what the number one network on television for 10 years straight or something like that. Um, a hit on CBS today uh, would not, might have canceled a, the show five years ago. <laughs> like, I mean, so I, I think like this move where the, the, the consumer or the audience is empowered uh, is only going to get stronger. Mm -hmm. Can I say? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, Fast and the Furious is great, <laughs> first of all. I just think that we need more of a, of a balance, as, as you were saying. Because I think that when we are served as a community so much icing, like let's give you the sweet stuff, the stuff that's flashy, the stuff that's very much like, like on the outside, very superficial, it makes it seem that as a community that's all that we want, when in reality we also need the cake, we need the substance too, and we need to make sure that we're not just entertaining yeah. the masses, we need to empower the masses too with the work that we both watch and the work that we request to watch. So I'm not sure how we do it, but I think that maybe it starts maybe at the media, uh, the high levels by, by knowing that we are diverse. Not all Latinos like salsa, but many do, but still we're very, we're, we're very unique. And with that, I think it also starts with, with us just requesting those things and, and supporting those projects. And I think also just yep. to add in, when you look at shows like Awkward Black Girl by Issa Rae, I mean, that was a web series that yep. she's now inking deals left and right. Yep. So she's cross platforms, you know, she's doing a tremendous amount of work and it started with a, a web series that had representations of people of color that were not sort of, you know, cookie cutter representations. And it spoke to and, and touched a lot of people. So I think that's an example of something that really went from the web and now is moving beyond beyond that. Um, I want to thank our panel so much. This was really great. Thank you.